All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Carvel Community Meeting. These meetings are being recorded and uploaded to our YouTube playlist. So please, please uh, read and abide by our code of conduct, which is listed out here in the agenda. If you have anything that you would like to bring up with the maintainers during this meeting, anything you wish to discuss or need help with, please put that down in discussion topics or triage help. Um, for anything that we do not get to during this meeting, we do have Carvel office hours, which are held every second and fourth Thursday. So this week we will be meeting for office hours at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time, 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. Please feel free to join those as well. If there's anything you need, um, any sort of in-depth help help on for Carvel office hours or just want to attend to listen in, we welcome you to join us. Today's date is May 10th, 2021. Please add your name and the organization you represent or if you're just representing yourself, uh, we'd like to keep note of who all is attending these meetings. So add that here to the agenda. For announcements, uh, we did have, we did participate in KubeCon Europe last week virtually. Uh, we had Carvel had a 30-minute uh, talk, which we'll add to the agenda and to our YouTube playlist once that is uploaded to the CNCF KubeCon playlist. We also had a demo that played during the conference at the VMware's virtual booth, which you can click on here to view. Next, we still have our staff engineer role open. Uh, if you are interested, or if you know anyone that is interested, please click on that link, review the job description and apply. We also welcome you to ask any questions about the role in the public Kubernetes Slack channel that we have. It's just uh, Carvel is the name of our channel. And, and if you're interested in the role, just shoot your questions over there and we'll be happy to answer them. <clears throat> we also had a release for image package uh, version 0.7 and we invite you to look over all those details there about what's new with it, the performance improvement and all the other release notes. Does anyone from the team want to address anything further for that particular release? Uh, no, I think you basically covered it. Uh, the major, the major thing for this release was uh, the performance improvement when you're copying uh, images between registries. Uh, just to um, oh, and there's another big, big thing there is that we we change we renamed one, one of the flags that was include non-distributable. It became include non-distributable layers. So if you were using an this flag, please update your scripts when you update to 070. And we also added uh, support for uh, environment variables keychain. So you can provide multiple usernames and passwords for multiple registries using your uh, environment variables. So those are like the, the big chunk items here. Um, so that was that. Great. Thanks, Joelle, for sharing that. Uh, and then moving on to status updates, I will hand that on over to Aaron. Do you want to take the reins for the rest of the agenda? Sounds good. All right. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. And I will share my side. Cool. So the first item, uh, we had a proposal that was accepted last week, maintaining Carvel documentation. Um, so this is around adding versions to the, the documents on the, the Carvel website. Um, feel free to click in there to learn more. John, any other high level takeaways you wanna share? No, that's it. Cool. Uh, then the next update is on the package manager API. Um, still very much in flight. Is there anything you wanna call out there, Eli? Or Daniel? Um, nothing in particular. We've just started working on that proposal we talked about last time to split the CR 
um, we didn't get much feedback following those meetings. So we just went forward with it. And we've also started working on adding schemas to the package CR so consumers can know their data values or like what the configuration mobs are for a package. Cool, thank you. Uh, and then YTT, we have the schemas V1 type checking in progress. Anyone want to share any news there from the last week? Yeah, we have a couple of big chunks that are going right now. One is about uh, the ability to provide, to overlay uh, schema files. So this is um, very useful when you've inherited someone else's YTT library and you want to add additional variables. You want to declare more variables. Um, you can do that, or data values. You can do that by adding your schema and your additional templating that makes use of that. That's in flight. The other is um, a really important feature around being able to uh, turn off schema checking for certain portions of uh, your values. Maybe there's some reason that you just want something to be a pass through and you don't want any checking. Um, that's also in flight. Uh, with with these, um, we're we're really looking toward uh, the next thing is starting to provide some base documentation for the overall feature and um, and starting to move into a, a usability testing and some hardening. Um, so we're looking forward to that. That's kind of exciting that we're like getting to the point where we're coming in for not quite at the final approach, but we're getting there um, on this really valuable and important feature. Uh, there are a couple folks that worked on uh, these pieces did I miss anything? Anything you'd like to add? Uh, okay, cool. Thanks, folks. All right. And then the next track of work that's been identified is the accept data values as plain YAML for YTT. Um, the proposal was accepted last week and plan to chat about it this week. Anything else to share right now? Yeah, we'll we'll do an overview when we get into the the back. We got a couple of stories that we can point today around that. In the start of that is it is an overview, so we'll we'll hit those then. Cool. Anyone else have any updates that they want to share? Uh, not really update, but I like I'm I'm trying to get for next Thursday. See if we can get to move moving along our rename proposal. So uh, I haven't decided what parts of the proposal that we need to look at right now. I need to get to get a refresh on that. But if there's anything on that proposal that you have any questions, just let me know so that we can pick them up uh, on next Thursday so that we can move this forward, move this uh, proposal forward. That's just it. Do you mean this coming Thursday or the following Thursday? Um, we have working. Uh, we have working hours. This uh, working hours. I forget the name. We have a meeting on Thursday. Office so, hours. Office hours, right? This Thursday, right? So maybe we'll try to use that time. Cool. Anything else? All right. Let's dive into this week's plans. So let's start with schemas v1. Would it now be a good time to discuss the next story? Yeah, let's take a look at that. All right, so um, this is a different kind of story. This is a, a story about given given uh, a seemingly completed feature, like how well does it meet uh, users' usage? So here's some, there's three sections here. There's like, what's the goal of this work to either uh, validate or invalidate some assumptions that we have? And we intend to do that by crafting uh, some interview sessions, if you will, or working sessions with actual users, where we give them a task and we say, how would you complete this? Give them just enough information that they can try and use the feature to meet the task. And then we see them, we watch them do it. And 
the things that seem to come natural will be sort of obvious as we watch and the things that seem awkward or difficult or unclear uh, will show up as they struggle with pieces. And people have different experiences, so we would hope to get um, more than just one uh, interview going here. So the the scope of this is to to craft the agenda for that uh, the usability testing here, and from there we'll know like what the exact set of stories in terms of like work items we need to actually conduct those interviews. Uh, so this this spawns out a little bit more. So it's a little bit of a, a kind of like planning slash exploration uh, type type story, if you will. Uh, that that last section is just a reminder about uh, some helpful thinking that, or some thing that ways of uh, thinking about that conversation that we have when we're interviewing users that tend to be more fruitful. If we ask people questions directly, we have this natural tendency to wanna um, give each other the answers we think that you wanna hear. So providing a little bit more of an indirect, providing the experience to occur and then make observing the, the usage as it happens tends to give us more reliable data. So that's what that's about. And there's a nice link to a book that talks about that. So again, more of a more of an explored. Any questions about this? Does this story include identifying volunteers for these usability tests? It doesn't. This is, this assumes that we've got those folks identified. Okay. Anything else? Uh, are we going to point this story or is just like for us to know? I hadn't thought about it. It's just an odd shaped piece of work. Like we could to sort of like get a sense of how much we want to invest in this. Should we try that? I don't do these kind of things very often. I can see a little bit of nodding. <laughs> Mostly poker faces. Okay, let's give it a shot. Uh, Joao doesn't want to. All right, sorry. Rough consensus is we'll 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 throw points on this. <laughs> sorry, Joao. All right, so we'll uh, throw points on the count of three. One, two, three. One and a two, and a one from Joao. Anybody want to talk about what they see? Yeah, I'll speak to my two. Um, in a previous track of work, I have attempted to tackle this kind of thing of writing up a user test and identifying people and uh, conducting those tests. And I found that the planning was, in fact, the most time consuming part of it. Um, so just based on how long I would expect someone to spend on making these plans and, and writing out future stories uh, for this track of work. It seemed like something I would, I would err on the side of giving someone more time or a larger estimate to work under. Cool, anyone else? Okay, um, I didn't throw any points. I wanted to stand back on this one. So I'm not sure how important it is, but like we had two votes for one, one vote for two. So should we just go with one for rough consensus? Sounds good. Should we move on to the next track or do we want to point the remove the future flag. I think we want to hang off for just a minute on that one. 
Cool. All right. So now talk about accept data values as a plain YAML file. Yeah. All right. So, so the essence of this feature is to introduce a new flag to YTT. And the name of that flag is dash dash data dash values dash file. Yeah, that thing right there. And what this will do is provide an, a, another way to supply a data values, set of data values. It's going to be different from data value, data values that we talk about today. And to be clear, I'll refer to the kinds of files that we've been referring to as data values so far, I'll refer to those as data value overlays. That's what we've been typically using to date in YTT to specify data values. They're actually overlays. And in contrast, these new types of files are going to be plain YAML. So they won't have any annotations in them. They'll just be straight YAML. It, they'll combine simply. So that means that instead of having rules about the user needing to disambiguate, oh, did you mean to add a new array item here or oh, this, the type that's being set used to, the, the target used to be an array, now it's a map, like you're trying to put a map on there, are you sure? Like we will actually just largely blindly follow whatever um, the new document uh, will do. So arrays, the values for arrays will get overwritten. The, uh, if, if it's a completely different type, the new type that shows up is the one that wins, sort of last one in wins kind of thing. Very simple combination rules. So that's sort of the the, the overall what. Um, it it sits in this family of flags. There's actually a, a set of flags that are like this, the data values flags. You might have recognized these as the ones where when you're pulling data values from either the command line or the environment environment variables, operating system environment variables. Those are the, the prefix for all of those. So this actually just extends uh, that set of flags to allow you to, in addition to providing values on the command line or environment variables, now you can include it as a file. So that's the spirit of selecting this as the, as the base of the flag name. Now, the motivation, though, for the feature, so why are we doing this, is a, a kind of, you can look at it from two perspectives. So one is from the integrator's perspective, and this is what's going to drive initially. And that is being able to provide those who are using YTT in their own tooling to kind of wrap, uh, use YT as, YTT as an implementation detail of their own tooling, uh, to not have to worry about making sure that this particular input file um has ytt annotations or anything like that or that there's even anything that's dynamic about them because maybe they don't want their users to necessarily insert uh starlark code into values that get input um, so this flag provides those integrators with the ability to extend this kind of input to their end users um and so in that way, like uh, the, the, their end users don't have to learn about YTT itself. So it simplifies the story that an integrator needs to tell to their end users. So that's one motivation. Uh, the other, and this is, this is something that's sort of a later in coming, is focused at those who are using YTT directly. So today, one of the um, uh, biggest sources of grief for most of our new users is in using data values. They can kind of get out the gate, but the moment they try and, for example, split a data values overlay into two files, it starts to become apparent they aren't just dealing with files that combine easily. They get these error messages that talk about a mechanism they didn't even know existed, perhaps, overlaying. Um, and so it's a rough experience. It's been, been that way. Um, and as YTT is growing up, one of the things that we're doing is trying to 
uh, improve that overall experience from beginning through expert level. Um, and so this is an attempt to try and put ultimately, not initially, but ultimately put this in the forefront as the way to provide data values because it's going to have a simpler um, experience because the because of the uh, combining the way that we're going to combine these values, and also with uh, the track we were talking about earlier, uh, schemas are going to help provide the checks that we need in order to be confident that the values that are provided uh, are values that the templates inside of a library ultimately expect. So data values don't need to do that anymore uh, when there's a schema present. So the combination of schema landing plus uh, providing the ability to provide just plain uh, YAML as data values, we're hoping is going to significantly improve the overall user experience when using YTT. So that's that's the big why. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, if we go back, yep, perfect, Aaron. So if we pull up the um, Carvel, yeah, so we see that the backlog's in, in two pieces at the moment. We've got a couple of stories that we can point today. And then we have uh, a set that are identified. There's even more that are going to be identified, pulled out of the proposal and um, and crafted, and, and we'll be able to point those in. But we'll, we'll tackle these, these two today, Get this one first. So here's the first how. Um, this to do was waiting on the proposal being approved, and that happened just not too long before this meeting. So we'll we'll update all these links here back into the right spot in the proposal. But it gives a justification as to why are we thinking we should hold off on making this feature initially very visible. Okay, so um, yeah, any questions about this one? So if if there was a data values file present, say in this directory, if if you were to use, I guess maybe that's my first question is like, would you use like a dot or something like that here and like point to a local directory? Um, you are going to specify an exact file name. OK. That's a great question. We're not globbing a bunch of files in. It's a, it's, it, it points to a single file. OK, cool. That answers my follow-up question. Yeah, so the input file, if it has any overlay annotations, um, does it still render, or does it error out? We're, are we not concerned? about that kind of validation as part of the story? We won't be concerned. And for now, the behavior will be just as it gets parsed, those are comments and they'll get ignored. There's a subsequent story further down the backlog to help provide better experience, like saying, hey, you uh, you included a YTT annotation here. That's not allowed. That's later. Okay. The process substitution bullet point, it says without a file name, rename what does that mean a phone name yeah rename. there's a yeah there's a feature in the dash dash file or dash f flag that if you were to prefix a file name 
uh, or, or, a, or a path with a file name equal uh, and then did process substitution. What process substitution will do here is I'll actually replace it with the file name. So this is like somewhere it varies on your distribution, but it creates a literal file, puts the, the contents there. If you had a uh, values.yaml equal, that's the rename portion. What we're okay. saying here is wouldn't be required. So that's the part of the story. It's just, you give it a file descriptor. You can't do this file name renaming after the story is finished just yet. Is that a subsequent story or it's just not gonna be supported? File name renaming when you pass it through a process substitution. I, uh, I don't think I've decided whether or not that's supported. It's not necessary. That's part of the story anyway. Okay. Yeah, certainly not part of the story, no. At this point, are we considering how, if you were to say, you know, dash F other files, like an existing data values, how that would interact? Okay. Nope. Interaction with uh, data values overlays will be considered later. Cool. These are great questions. And it's just, flag. sorry, you go first, Joao. Can this flag be used multiple times? Not right now, it can't, but there's a subsequent story in which it can. So we should cap that here. So you should not be able to. You don't have to go out of your way to prevent it, but you don't have to support it. So the bigger picture is that we will support multiple um, instances of these flags. Uh, leave it. Leave it to you to decide whether or not that's something that's like you just rather do that right then and there. Um, and so that subsequent story becomes maybe adding tests or validation or documentation. That's up to you, but it's not required for the story. I think that will increase the complexity of this story because then we do need to know how to merge to YAML documents. Right. That's, that's part of why I excluded it. Personally, I prefer to have a note here saying that you can only have this flag once for this story. Okay. And then we can handle it Sorry. on the next story if you want to add more. Because in the end, it's just like a Cobra function that we're going to call. That's a little mm -hmm. bit different. So I think we can handle that later. Cool. That's right. Any other notes that we want to capture right now? If we include this file with a minus F flag, so for example, you have the file on the root and you do minus F dot and then minus minus data value file values.yaml, what happens? Is it current, does like the current behavior is like it fails because it has a plain YAML file? So we don't need to worry. It may it may work, but it's not required to make it work in this story. So in this story, we're very very narrowly scoping to if you ran YTT and you included a data value data data values file through this flag, it would be the data values for the run. If there are other cases that you're considering, um, they may or may not work. The story doesn't try to spec that out. Okay. 
Anything else from folks? Any other questions or notes we want to capture? Okay, so that last comment made me see the story a little bit differently, but that's just me. I think I was seeing it as we just really want to see that data valleys inspect, you know, some knows that it's a data valley that got ingested, but we really we want to know that this data valley does you know eventually render template files with data values via mm -hmm. this flag as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just internally we can you know we pass it into data values and print it out with this data values inspect flag. And yeah, that's yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. That's a great call out. Like this data values uh, inspect, what it what it does render is what the ultimate contents are that are supplied to templates. So the good news is that basically guarantees, sorry, the output of that inspect flag tells you what templates see. And so it basically guarantees the full flow of the way that you're thinking about it. It's nice. already at the end of data values uh, pre-processing. Okay. I assume I schemas that. are out of the question here, right? We What's don't that? care about the interaction with schemas. Right. These are great. It's also making me realize it might have been helpful. And in, if I was sitting in your shoes, might have re reduced like the level of scope that I'm trying to consider. If we had gone over, did a flyover over the stories that exist right now, at least by title, then you get a sense of like, oh, okay, there's these things that are that are possibly being covered. Um, we'll do that after we point this story. But this is great. I mean. It's, Good signal about people trying to think through what what are the source of complexity. Why are we not concerned with schemas here? I thought it would just kind of quote unquote work after you data values pre-process. It's just mm -hmm. the pipeline. It, 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 it might just work just fine. Okay. Okay. In fact, cool. I expect it to, but there's nothing spec'd here in this story that requires it. Okay. So if we find that like for some reason it doesn't integrate well with schemas we continue to the next story and we maybe carve it off as a separate story. Yeah. Yeah, do notice there is no feature flag for this. So schemas would be turned off maybe. And if they are turned on, they're they're ready for prime time. Like if we've removed the schema experimental flag. So I would, I would, I would personally expect them to, there isn't any reason why I don't think that they would combine well but it's not required to even necessarily think about that for this story. Uh, does this mean that schemas is not gonna be released before we start this work or before this work is released? We're when probably gonna have to- Basically I, this story, right? I, ex I expect we'll probably have a couple of tracks of work at some point. Like, well, the, these will probably be in flight together for a little while, yeah. Okay, and we are okay releasing a version with the feature like this if push comes to shove. If push comes to shove, this will work. This is releasable. Yeah, thick. Great questions. I'm loving this. Or let's throw some points and then see see what the spread is, and maybe that also kind of turns something up. So take a moment to think about what you might imagine kinds of intrinsic work that needs to get done here. And I, I will point with you on this. I have one last question. It's, it's probably a corner case, yeah. but multiple doc sets in it in this file. What happens there? We see a dash dash dash. Do we just have multiple data values or? It's not, it's not required you support that, this story. Okay. If it Wait. just turns out simple just to just do it, oh. we do it, I suppose. Um, sure. But you don't have to. I wouldn't. Okay. Totally. Yeah, good. good. All right, so go ahead and give a thumbs up when you're ready to 
to throw some points. And sure, I'm going to wait just to be okay. Oh, nice. Good use of your reactions there. <laughs> All right, one, two, three. Oh, we got a great spread here. Love this. And Joel said two. We have two twos. We have a one and a three. Awesome. And we want to share what they see that has some source of complexity that hasn't yet been mentioned. I would I would have put a two just for the code changes and a one for documentation. I think adding new things to, I mean, I've, I've just found from my experience, it's just really hard to just, you know, make code changes in YTT, so usually tech data and learnings that need to be, that need to happen. So like, while it might seem like a, a one, I'm just adding another one based on the experience and then another point for documentation. Gotcha. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, I was a fairly, I was a fairly large one. And the reason for that was um, I didn't really see a lot of extra complexity added uh, in this for the coding part and the documentation part for the context that we're adding seems like just a very small documentation add as well. So I'm definitely willing to come up to a two. Um, but one thing I am very fuzzy about is the process substitution case. I'm not sure if that has some kind of inherent like, um, complexity that I'm not aware of. I see. Yeah, that, that's, that that's a great call out. Yeah. Right, that, that's, that's, a, that's a sort of a weird thing, right? It does, doesn't show up all that often. Um, let me respond to that real quick. The good news is from YTT's perspective, it's not, it's just another file. So by the time the, pro the, our pro the YTT process is running, it's handed a file descriptor just like any other file descriptor. And it looks like a file, it, it, it behaves all like a file, just all, it, it is a file actually under the cover. So the good news is it turns out it, it has zero impact. It's a, it's a opaque interface there, a convenience tool for uh, a shell user to be able to articulate the contents of what should be in the shape of a file and it sort of coerces it into that shape. So by the time we see it, that's it. It's notable here because, as you can see by the example, that's actually rather readable. Um, and so somebody, somebody could technically sort of use this in this way. So. Thanks for that clarity. Yeah. Hey, Joao, did you have any color you want to add? Or questions or? Uh, not really. I think this is like a, I, I do not count documentation as complexity, but I think it feels like that the process is going to take like a, it feels like it is going to be a simple thing, but you never know with YTT because in the end you should just need to read the file and you provide this information. Like the, the way we're doing is we're trying to find a, uh, an annotation to say that the file is a values, right? Now we don't need to do that search. So like the, it would be easier. So I think it, it's not going to be a major issue, but you never know. That's the number two there. Okay. All right. I'm hearing a rough consensus about two. Great chatter. Okay, so let's let's pause for just a second to to, to kind of take that fly over together. So the first story that we uh, talked about here is just accepting one file, just like we talked about. You got that baked in your head. And here we go. So what about multiple files? Boom, next story. And this one is going to include either um, you're, you're invoking the data-values-file flag multiple times and or a given file has multiple YAML documents inside it, all of them plain YAML. So that's the scope of that story. So that's now expanding out the set of inputs. And the third one is um, how how do um, these how does this feature interact with data values overlays? So what we normally think of as data values, but we're going to start trying to use this terminology, the data values overlays. How do they interact? Um, and the TLDR there is these act 
uh, sorry, the data values file acts just like the other data values flags, which is they're considered last, which gives them highest precedence. And so they can um, ultimately overwrite anything that's in an overlay file because they're the last in line. Um, so that's that's what that's about. And then, of course, uh, I don't know if this was nagging in the back of folks' minds, but it's an another dimension here is, well, what about libraries? Um, good news, there's an annotation, sorry, there's a notation for doing that with the dash data values flags already, and we're just adopting that for this flag as well. And so that's doing that implementation there. And then uh, the next uh, identified story, there's more to come, but uh, next identified story here is, let's provide a better experience like uh, Dennis was asking, um, what about overlays? Uh, and um, so providing that kind of input here uh, means something didn't go right. Um, and we wanna protect this particular input as accepting nothing but YAML. We don't want someone to think that they're providing star alert code, like some if statement or for loop that would blow up, bl blow out into sets of values that should be data values. And it just get ceremoniously ignored because it's a comment. Um, so we want to be really clear that this we will not be evaluating anything inside this file. We're just parsing it. So the best way to do that is just to say uh, we don't accept any templating. And so that's what this story is about there. There's more, a few more bits to add uh, in terms of stories, but that's just like kind of the initial set of runway here. Yeah, sorry I didn't do that before. That can really help in, in like getting a sense of, all right, well, are you going to cover these other things? Okay. So when we say private libraries there, are we talking really about private libraries or are we talking about libraries that are provided in a YTT, in YTT? Oh, okay. So what we mean, what we mean by this is any, sorry, I have to like edit because like there's a, there's a literal way to describe this. It might be a little awkward, but this is anything that you would do would normally not get evaluated unless you did a library get and evaluate. So when you do a library get and then go to evaluate, the the um, data values that showed up either from a data values overlay, there's a library slash ref annotation. You could say here, configure this dependency of the root library. And it's like, oh, okay, I'll not put those toward the root, but I'll target those for uh, that dependency and configure that dependency. It gives the end user the ability to reach in and drop data values there. This is going to be the same thing where if uh, any dependency that gets library.get inside some template inside the root library um, and then for evaluated, when its data values need to be calculated, these will get included. Okay, I thought you always had to specify if you're passing a value to a library, it doesn't really matter if it's private or not. I thought you always had to add use ref. Yeah, and I'm I'm using the word private sort of loosely here. It just means anything that isn't going to get automatically evaluated. Uh um any any um any portion of the library tree that doesn't get evaluated automatically which we've been sort of colloquially referring to as private libraries. Um, uh, in usage, it's anything that sits under an underscore YTT underscore lib. That's uh, considered private. Sounds good. Um, I'm going to say that it strikes me a little bit strange that you can provide YTT specific um, YTT specific comments here to provide these values to the live private libraries in a plain YAML file. It, it won't it be a comment. A bit, it strikes it's, me a little bit it, odd. It's, it's, but... it's not a comment. It's a, it'll be a command line flag argument. We'll, so we'll get there. Okay, we'll get yeah. there. Okay, cool. We'll get there. You'd be right. That would be strange. <laughs> cool. uh, <laughs> All right, well, let's let's jump into this next one. We we got time still. How are we how are we doing on do a quick time check? We good, Aaron? Yeah, we have nine minutes. Okay. 
I do have I a question. Rush. Is this yeah. going to be like the, is this, we're, this is going to be like the last story we're going to point, right? This one are is. Are there no other stories that we want to point that are not YTT specific? Or are we just going to be working in YTT this week? It's a good question. I don't know. I am not aware of any, I guess, non YTT stories that have been prioritized for this week. I don't know, Helen, is there anything you had in mind? Yeah, I would say right now, currently, our priority is uh, YTT. Cool. I see the thumbs up. Thank you. Okay. So, kind of coming back to the beginning of that path, step one in, we've got data values file. Step two, multiple files here. So, take a look at this. That's a typo. Uh, sorry, isn't the default behavior on arrays append right now? Like when we have like multiple arrays, the default behavior is replace or append. Okay, yeah. So good. This this is important kind of subtopic that's sort of in, implied in the spec but not explicit. So let's make it explicit. So one of the mo one of the important things. Remember, when I talked about how data values files are going to combine more simply. Um, so how will, how will that work? So in the, in the case of arrays, we're actually going to be replacing the values as is spec here. And um, so you might wonder, well, how might we achieve that? Uh, so this is one of those moments where I suspect I mean, it's 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 going to be up to those who are picking up the story stories and working on them. But I strongly suspect that, given we have a mechanism that for combining structures, that is overlays, uh, that we might want to use them as an implementation detail for this. That is, we might we might want to reuse that mechanism. But if that's the case, then like Joao, you're pointing out, it's like, well, wait a second, that doesn't do replace. So um, that's a good question. There's some there's some details in here to like hash out about. Well, uh, perhaps perhaps either we need to find a way of translating these files into templates and evaluating them that way. And when there's an array value that you build a, a replace annotation on top of that, or perhaps the overlay mechanism in general has two modes where uh, one mode is more strict and the other mode is more simple. And in the simple case, we have uh, a set of defined behaviors that um, checking to see, uh, do, doing, doing that actual merge uh, becomes um, not an option if you're in this simple mode. Possibilities. I'm not gonna dictate like what the approach should be, but I'm hoping to, to give you a little bit of a sketch of like, it's the behavior is going to be different necessarily and for reason. And in this case, it's going to be simply you replace the value. Do you want me to scroll down? It's the next one. Okay. Everybody had a chance to look at it. Okay.
Just give me a thumbs up when you're ready to scroll further. we doing all right let's let's take a preliminary round of pointing just to kind of see where we're at with this just take a minute here to think about all what's involved. Give a thumbs up when you when you're ready. So like uh, these replace union merge logic. Is there a place in our is there a place in our code that we can just call certain functions and leveraged existing implementations? Or is there a library we, we know out there that kind of does something we can do? Or are we thinking of just building this out mainly from scratch? So somewhere in between. There, there, we are doing these kinds of operations right now today. So it's not like it's from scratch. Um, but like if you were to just try and overlay these two things without doing anything special right now, it wouldn't exactly work. Like. If you if you said okay this is this is overlaying on top like take this new turn 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 the data values file that got provided and then say here you're an overlay <laughs> like just drop it's on this it, gonna, it, it's you'll, you get those overlay errors yeah so we start replacing so, okay. so either the overlay mechanism needs to be matured a bit to uh, be configured to to occur in a different way perhaps so think of overlays there as like an internal API that you can also use as a piece of code of YTT. So it's like a little library for combining YAML structures. Um, or we say, uh, we think that it would be better if we sh kept that complexity inside this mechanism and we would hand write like insert in annotations in, tr in uh, uh, overlay mm -hmm. annotations ourselves and then apply that as overlay as is. So something like that okay. won't work as is, needs needs work. It's a couple of different implementation approaches. Mm -hmm. And then there's like examples that I can think of that don't fit completely these three dots. And I'm just gonna keep them as we'll we'll find we'll find our rules for these examples. Um, maybe through the proposal by just asking the team. Um, and I'll keep them as unknown complexity. Okay. Now. Okay. Anyone else? Give me a thumbs up when you think you might be ready to throw points. Okay. Dennis, are you? Okay. All right. Let's do it. One, two, three. Three, three, two. And I threw a five. Anyone? I was like large three, small five in my in my book. Like feels like there's a lot of stuff that exists, but um, uh, it's like pulling all that together and like maybe a little bit of expert. There's some unknown about like overall approach, and so inherent in that I think is kind of sussing out like which approach might be better with some work in addition to the documentation and. The other stuff. Anybody else see other sources of complexity? Okay. 
Um, I think rough consensus was three. Cool. All right. All right. That's what we got time for. A little cool. bit over. Sorry about that, Aaron. All good. Um, and maybe one last prompt I'll have you consider is I think from feedback from our latest three point stories has been trying to think of ways to break things further down. So something to think about. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, Nancy, do you want to close us out or I'm happy to. Sure. I will close us on out. Uh, as far as the discussion topic on review recent proposed changes to GitHub issue triage, uh, is that something we'll be moving to office hours later this week? I'll, I'll bump that over there, Nancy. Great call out. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right. Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining today's community meeting for Carvel. If you're unable to attend our Monday community meetings, we do meet every Monday at 1130 a.m. Pacific time. We also have our Carvel office hours, which we meet every second and fourth Thursday of the month at 1130 a.m. Pacific time, 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. And we will be meeting this week on May 13th. And like I just mentioned, um, one of the items that we weren't able to get to today will be moved to that office hours for further discussion. And if you have anything that you need help with from the Carvel maintainers or have any questions regarding the tool suite, please join us for those office hours or the community meeting, or even uh, join us in Slack on the Kubernetes public workspace in the Carvel Slack channel. Hopefully we will see you around in one of those options, but uh, until then, have a good week. Thank you.